Well, I don't have to ask how you're doing. I can tell by your worship this morning. Uh, if you were not doing better, good before you got here, you're doing better now. Can I get an amen? And no incident that worship was as it was this morning. The Holy Spirit knows what I'm talking about this morning. But first, I want to say, um, after giving all glory to God, Jesus, my Lord and Savior, my everything, in my prayer today that he is that for you as well. Can I get an amen? And if he's not, there will be opportunity to end for you to make him so. Can I get an amen? But first, I want to, I already had one person this morning ask me, where your wife? Church, you know what? My wife is in Wilmington, North Carolina with her family. She still loves me. <laughs> She's not at home, you know, loading up the pistol. No, no. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I love my baby and I do miss her. But I want to get right into this word. And it's from my heart. Uh, I study worship. I'm no musician. I can't sing well enough to sing in this mic. But it's a passion of mine, and I want, to, I want to go into it a little bit this morning. And I didn't intend to, but I'll get into that. But every staff morning in my office, the staff comes into my office first thing in the morning. This has gone on for 10 years, ever since I've been the lead pastor. And if the interns are in, they gather in with us as well. And we have a time of first thing in the morning, 9 a.m. Anybody who want to come in, join in. Some of you have, just come on in. It's all right. Devotion. Often it's exhortation, often it's a worship song, and we pray. And we rotate with, with who leads it. And Tuesdays, I, I was doing Thursday, but now that the interns are in, I changed to Tuesday because I always want them in front of me while I'm there to get as much time with them as possible. So I changed myself to Tuesday. So the last Tuesday, I led devotion. And I was running late from home, and my goodness, I hadn't prepared, and I just flipped over one of my favorite devotionals. You might want to write it down. It's by A.W. Tozer. It's Tozer on Christian leadership. And I went to that day for that devotional, and, and out of that, I went into the office early, and out of that, I began to remember some things and contemplate some things. And, and so when I sat down with them, I didn't just read them the, a devotional. I began to share some of my personal experiences and perspectives from my heart on the subject of that morning's Tozer reading. I was going to begin a new series this morning, Famous Last Words, talking about the words of Christ. But the next day after that devotional, some of the creative staff came in and they said, uh, Pastor, that was good. Why don't you share that Sunday? So, plus they needed some scheduling things. I said, okay. And so it was about a 20-minute devotional, but it turned into about an hour and a half message. So you ready? taking my time this morning, Peachtree City. I get there. So this message is titled, The Sounds of Worship. The Sounds of Worship. Let's pray. Father, I just come to you right now in the precious name of Jesus. We lift your name high in this place, Father God. We worship you in this house, Lord God. I'm so thankful that this house has a legacy of worshiping you, Father God. So now, Lord God, I pray, Lord, by, by your word, Lord God, and by you using your servant that you even take us to a higher place of awareness in this area of worship, higher and higher. Father God, it's my prayer for the worship in this house and the worship of every believer that, lead, that hears this message. So come now, Holy Spirit, in a special way on each one of us, Lord, and teach as you do from your word. Through me, I pray in the precious name of Jesus. I want to begin this morning's me message in a different way. We got an, oh my goodness, worship team that's off the charts. But I'm going to play a worship song, and it's a song that I actually played last Tuesday morning in that worship at the beginning of this, because it's a song, I'll tell you about it in a minute why it's special. Go ahead and, and play that song, and you're familiar with it. And turn it up.
You know, it's a, a powerful worship song. But what's more powerful, what more personal for me is the monumental place that that particular worship team has in my personal experience in worship. The band, the band is called Maranatha. And it's a band that's, that's all men, it was a choir that's all men. And it was, it was, it was the worship team of a, a men's awakening movement. I know it's not Father's Day, but I'm gonna go here because this is the moment. A men's awakening movement that was called Promise Keepers. And it was found that it was, it was a movement that was found in 1990 by Coach Bill McCartney, who was then the head football coach of the Colorado, University of Colorado Buffaloes. Coach Bill McCartney, Coach Bill, just got a little testimony behind it. And his wife, Lindy, she's fairly recently deceased in, 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 in 2013, but back then, he and his wife, they later shared, after this turn into stadium events and, and the huge movement that we know it was today, that in the early beginnings of the movement, privately, things were very difficult at home. I'm not sharing anything confidential. You can read it for yourself out there. In the first weeks of this movement, this great movement, Coach Bill suddenly came home and he voluntarily confessed to Lindy that he had committed adultery 20 years before. And also at the same time, his, his daughter had become pregnant twice by two different football players that were on his football team. And Lindy's testimony is that as a result of the, the early beginnings while promise keepers were being birthed into it was today, at home, she was suffering with deep depression, lost 80 pounds to bulimia, bulimia and having suicidal thoughts. However, she also testified that in those same early days, her husband changed into the best man, the best husband, and best father she had ever experienced, leading to lead her and her family and her daughter to full recovery. See, God used a, a, a broken man, a broken husband, and a broken father to begin a movement that would literally impact hundreds of thousands of men for Christ, including me. Okay, that's a little appendage to last week's Father's Day in case anyone feels like you're just too broken to worship God. Now back to my worship message. 1996, same period Coach Bill had all this going on at home. I was here at New City Church. Back then it was Atlanta City Church and I was an usher, a lead usher on the back door at that time. And life looked good. Life in church looked good. But life at home was a wreck. Most of you know my testimony. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Living a double life. Looked good at church. Looked good at work. But a functional addict. Trying but failing over and over. And at the same time, this church was a mess. It had just gone through a major church split. But here comes men's minister, we're embracing promise keepers, and I find myself in the Omni, which is the Atlanta Hawks. Go Hawks, come on, we, we can come back from the last game, right? <laughs> Maybe we need one more stop, no. But it was the Omni, which was the Hawks uh, 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 stadium at the time, and somehow I find myself going to this first large promise keepers event, 17,000 men. And I remember I'm walking in, and somehow a group went from the church. Somehow I landed in the seat sitting right next to the then senior pastor, senior, well, Pastor Rick Snow. And I felt awkward for a number of reasons. And then that band that we just heard, Maranatha Band, started into worship. And 17,000 men in a closed arena 
began to loudly sing worship. And I remember looking around and seeing a lot of brokenness on men of the faces. I saw men weeping on each other's shoulders. You see, people know me now. I was crying and worshiping this this morning. I was not always a big crier before that moment. It started then. And I believe that moment, 17,000 men being led by a very broken leader, but the presence of God so powerful was the first time I actually worshiped I believe truly worshiping in spirit and truth. And then a very few weeks later came my deliverance. And my coming home, a better man, a better husband, and a better father. Mind you, I was sitting in those back seats, just a, not just a, but a lead worship, a lead usher in the church. But just a few months later, things began to accelerate, and the next thing you know, I find myself an assigned leader of a bus. We took busloads of men up to an event in Washington. You got that, that picture? Go ahead and put, put it up. In Washington, D.C., they got that slide. I was there. I was about two-thirds of the way up on the right. For real. In front of the Smithsonian kneeling, worshiping with, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands, with pictures of my family spread out on the lawn, making promises to them that I've never broken to this day. Feeling that watering the lawn with tears. But the journey began in worship. 1996 in the Omni with 17,000 men. Yes, there was a song. We heard a powerful song. But I'm here to tell you this morning, and I want to I wanna teach you this this morning, that, that, that there, was, there was a song, but there was something before the song. I remember sitting quietly in the Omni before the music, a crowd around me, but I was in this quiet state of being overwhelmed. And not so much overwhelmed by 17,000 men, not, not, not so overwhelmed by sitting by the senior pa uh, 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 pastor. I, I was overwhelmed by this awareness, I would say for me, a new awareness of the presence of God. Awareness of his majesty. Awareness of his authority. Awareness of his sovereignty, awareness of his love, awareness of his mercy, and awareness of his grace on my life. Then came this unyielding compulsion to worship him. Then came the tears. Jesus now and forever seated on the throne of my life. My life. I'm here to tell you this morning, the first sound of worship is silence before God. The first sound of worship is silence. Let me go back to that, that morning with the, the staff and interns. Toes just start in the book of Habakkuk 2, 18 through 20. And I read, it says, what prophet is the image? that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, the make, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says the wood awake, to sound and stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, that's anything man made. Yet in it there is no breath at all. Listen to verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple let all the earth keep silence before him. And in the devotion of text, he went on to say, this is from Tozer, 
So I've got to tell you that if you do not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship him in one day a week. There's no such thing known in heaven as Sunday worship unless it is accompanied by Monday worship and Tuesday worship and so on. He goes on and says, we come into God's house and say, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let us all kneel before him. Very nice. I think it is nice to start a service that way once in a while. But when any of you men or women enter your office Monday morning at 9 o'clock, if you can't walk into that office and say, the Lord is in my office, let all the world be silent before him, then you're not worshiping the Lord. I looked at the interns that morning. See two of them over here. What are the rest of y'all? Raise your hand. Where are they? Interns, stand up. The ones that are here. Little summer peach you sitting. Come on, don't be bashful. There's seven of y'all somewhere. Why are y'all sitting there like? See, they, they, they want to get up and help me preach. I don't know what the rest of them are. It's seven total anyway. What the rest of your bunch? Two nookie? Yeah. <laughs> I told the interns, y'all can sit down, thank you. They know they're cute. They just want to stand up and do it. Looking at the interns, I told them what I'm watching for, one thing that I'm watching for is I'm watching for their worship. Then I know they're, they're, with all that we pour into them over these next weeks, then I know they're getting something that will carry them for it. But I told them before the, what we see, you must first find the silence. Where so many young people and old people are, are missing the, the silence when we enter into worship on Sunday morning, our traditional church way is to wait for the band to crank up, wait, wait for the song, preferably one I really like, and then as we say, we get our worship on. But I'm here to tell you this morning, while we are waiting for the song, God is waiting for the silence first. Then the song. Silence sing of every competing and distracting sound, silencing of everything of this world, silence, silencing of all your competing fear, fears and feelings and frustrations and angers and unfulfilled dreams and hopes, personal desires, silence before the very presence of God. Then you're ready to worship. There's always, there's an incredible moment in the book of Revelation. How many know I love the book of Revelation? So we're going there again. Book of Genesis, book of Revelation, everything in between is just connecting one to the other. It's all God. But there's an incredible moment in the book of Revelation that when I hit it, it always rivets me. But leading up to that moment, Leading up, the, the Apostle John first sees a vision of the throne room of, God, room of God. And then he sees what he describes as a lamb in the midst of the throne. I want to go there at Revelation chapter 5 this morning. Come on, let's going to go there together. Revelation chapter 5. I'm going to read the whole chapter. And John said, and I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, John said, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. That would be Jesus. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. In other words, still carrying the scars of, 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 of the cross. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the other earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him, the father, who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. For you were slain 
and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people of nation and have made us kings and priests to our gods and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth as such are in the sea and all that are in them. I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said amen and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. What a scene. He said, and then after that, I'm going to show, in, in chapter 6, John watches as the lamb proceeds to break open the seals on the scroll, the seven seals, one by one. And the first six seals unleash unprecedented judgment on the earth. And this is known as the, as the period of tribulation. You're still with me? that many theologians believe we are in, and I lean to agree. Then in chapter 7, when the seventh seal is broken, John sees an, an innumerable mass of people standing before the throne of God. And by the way, I want you to go back and read that chapter 6 on your own, and, and where I land is somewhere between the first and the fourth seal. Really somewhere between the third and the fourth, but re, re, no time for that right now. Talk to Dr. Willie if you need some help. Then in chapter 7, when, when the seventh seal is broken, John sees this huge mass of people standing before the throne of God. These are what is known as the raptured ones. Some theologians, theologians say it to be pre-tribulation, some say post-tribulation, but what I'm seeing now, I lean to post-tribulation. Rapture. Let's read it. Chapter 7. Talking about worship. Chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, John said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them, and they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And then immediately following that, that, that verse of Scripture, verse 8, Chapter 8, verse 1, following this incredible gathering of redeemed humanity before the throne of God came the verse, the moment that always captures me. Revelation 8, 1, one verse. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Imagine that. Imagine that. Thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, angels, redeemed men, standing before the throne room of heaven. And when he opened the seven seals, he 
He said, for about 30 minutes. I want you to put yourself there. In fact, let me give you a little Bible revelation. If you are a born-again Christian, you will be there. This is post-rapture. This is every believer who called on the name of the Lord since Jesus went to the the cross and anyone before believed in his coming, you will be there standing before the throne. I wonder in that 30 minutes of silence what will be on my mind. I wonder... What will be on your mind? Your faults and failures? Your trials and troubles of this world? Race? Politics? The rest of the list? I don't think so. I don't think so. Psalm 46.10, David knows about being silent before the Lord. He said, be still and know that I am God. This is God speaking to David, teaching David. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in in the earth. Job figured it out in Job 44. After he had finished arguing with God about all his troubles and, and, and finally come to the realization of the, of the majesty of God, he says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. After all this complaining, Psalm 65 to, uh, 62, 5, David wrote again, My soul, speaking to, to his soul, sometimes you got to talk to your soul. My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. And Zechariah prophesied before the people, be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. The first sound of worship is silence. What I call, what many of us need today, we need a a holy shut up. A holy shut up. In the people of God. Let me, let me share a, a one more perspective. This isn't a series, so I got to get it all now. another perspective of worship that we need to understand. You know, sometimes when worship is like it was this morning, I hear people sometimes say, and, and I say it, I've said, you know, God showed up this morning, showed up. Anybody ever heard that? Come on, anybody ever said it? Come on now. You know, I used to say it. I used to say the same with the, with the best and holiest intentions. So I saw something in my study of worship that we need to grab a hold of. We said God showed up. Let me correct that perspective a little bit. We are not the host of worship. We are the guests. Let me say it again. We, we're not the host of worship. We are the guests. God is the host. God does not enter into our worship. We get to enter into the worship of him. Come on, shift. I want the worship in this church to be so off the chain, but it only comes in spirit and truth. God does not enter into our worship. We get to enter into the worship of him. You see, the worship is continuous from heaven and the earth before we even strike the first note. We're just joining in. In heaven, the multitudes assemble before him. In churches, we assemble before him. His presence is manifest because you came to him in worship, not because he came to you. Because you presented 
yourself before him to worship. Psalm 95, 1 through 2 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. 1 Chronicles 16, 29 through 30, give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. You see, there are many sounds and songs of worship. And there are many forms of worship, dancing, lifting of the hands, singing, bowing, kneeling. But the first sound of worship church must be the sound of silence in your heart, in your mind, sometimes even in the church. Mind, body, soul, and spirit giving all attention to the object of your worship. We present ourselves before him. It's a decision. It's a decision. Free will decision. And every man and woman, believer or not, gets to decide to choose. I observed the last year carefully. And I can honestly say the Lord has spoken to me. And what I've seen, among other things, I see too many people, to be honest, come on, let's go home, family. Too many people in New City Church and out of New City Church that for whatever reason drifted away, resigned, quit, withdrawn. And in the vast majority of those cases, what is, what is lost is not necessarily a loss of belief in Jesus as much as a, a loss of awareness. Awareness of the power of God. Awareness of the sovereignty of God. Awareness of his majesty, his authority. Awareness of his, his love, his mercy, grace. Awareness, no matter what you see on the news, no matter what your coworkers say, no matter what you experience, God is having his way on the earth right now. He's having his way. No matter how bad it looks, let me tell you, it, it doesn't look as bad as it's going to get. Loss of awareness that the seals of his holy plan are, are opening right before our very eyes. But many Christians are too consumed by the events happening before, but happening below to see the events going on above. A loss of awareness of what God is doing. And when you lose that awareness of what God is doing, you will not properly as a believer process what's going on below. And what's inevitably follows, when you lose, a, when you lose that, that, that loss of awareness of the, the extreme, unstoppable, sovereign, overriding power of God, you lose the preciousness of worship. And many believers, and I know some, have allowed the trials and failures and sins of this world and sometimes the failures in the church to steal away from them the awareness of what God is doing today. When you lose the awareness of the mercy and grace of God, you lose grace and mercy in your own life.
and you will be standing before that throne with all of the redeemed if you love Jesus. What will be on your mind then? In that 30 minutes of silence. If this message was for you today, I, and I'm not going to have a show of hands because it's, it's been a rough year. And I've had my points of failures as well. But if this message is for you, I want you to ask yourself these three questions. For you individually, what is stealing away your awareness? Personally. Because it's different things for different people. For some, it's, it's the family chatter. For some, it's the news media. And for some, it's your own feelings. But what, what, but what is stealing away your awareness of what God is doing? And related to that, the second question, what is competing for your silence before God? What's competing for your silence? What voices, what devices, what, your, what of your own thoughts? And the third question is, I had to ask myself, why are you allowing this? What, what has so overwhelmed you? What, what has so convinced you? What, 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 what has so grabbed hold of your thoughts and your feelings and your allegiance that you allow this? You know, a lot of people study the news to see what's going on. I look at the news, but to really see what's going on, guess what? I study the Word of God. I can see you in one chapter, chapter 6. Now look at the news. Chapter 6 of Revelation. You see the news just a bit differently. Revelation 8-1. When he opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And after that, if you go to your Bible, it wasn't straight into worship. They were quiet before God. Because now that the unredeemed have been raptured, removed from the earth, God was about to pour out the fullness of his vengeance on everything that does not believe upon the earth. And they stood silently before him, the redeemed. John says, saw 30 minutes of silence. What will be on your mind? What I want to do right now is, in a little bit differently, is, he said he saw 30 minutes of silence in heaven. I just said, well, 10's a good number, number of new beginnings. Divide that 30 by 10. I just want to take three minutes of us sitting silently before him. Well, what do I think about? What do I think about? Th Let's try Colossians 3, 1 through 4. It says, if them you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Three minutes.
If you would, go ahead and put that um, salvation prayer up. Come on, let's all stand. Come on, let's all repeat this together. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I know that I am a sinner, and I repent for my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Today I've been made new. From this day forward, I will follow you. If that prayer is in your heart for the hundredth time or for the first time, if it's really in your heart, if you really believe, on that great day in heaven that John saw thousands upon thousands and thousands and thousands from every nation, every race, every creed, standing before the throne, you will be in that number. Thank God. But right now, here we are, in the meantime, waiting for that great day of the Lord. And all he asks us to do, serve him now and worship him now in spirit and in truth. Amen? Come on, let's worship together one more time and then we'll see what happens. 